had uh, Shirley Coles D. Gordy, who's a writer, publisher, uh, policy analyst, human rights activist, and lobbyist, who's been working with, um, along with her husband, and both of whom are here, former Congressman Joe DiGuardi is here in the audience. He actually spent the entire day with us yesterday. But they've been working to get us access on Capitol Hill through researching federal legislation on child sexual abuse, and as well as helping us understand the language is very different on Capitol Hill and how we help um, our congressmen and senators to realize that this is a national priority or needs to be a national priority. So when we, after our presentations, we then broke out into our seven action teams. You should all have this brochure in your, fly, in your folder so you can read about what they are. I'm not gonna go into all of those. But I wanna tell you a couple of projects that we've been working on. One of the things that we have is what's called the Violence Research Digest. Um, you can go to our website and download a free copy. But in part, we realize we do have to translate research into practice. So we have this document that really tries to take some of the jargon out of that. The other thing that we do and what all of you are hopefully doing while you're here is networking professionals in their communities. As you heard from Bob, we have many people from all over the country as well as other countries. It's an opportunity for you to collect business cards and our goal is to establish a network um, nationwide, trained in trauma-informed care, as well as those who provide other direct services to be able to see the national partnership as a resource. A major undertaking that we're currently working on is called the Handbook of Interpersonal Violence Across the Lifespan. We actually have a contract with uh, Springer Publishers and we're working diligently um, to start collecting chapters for that book. It's going to be a two to three volume. Um, I, I mean, I think essentially it's going to propel us forward when it comes to interpersonal violence um, with the state of the art science and practice from all aspects. So it's expected to be somewhere between 100 and 150 chapters. So those of you who like to write, get in touch with us. Additionally, another thing that we do, um, you know that IVAT has a number of journals. Um, as part of those journals, we have been writing special issues, and we had one in particular uh, recently in which the practice action team is working on, again, with Brown Trauma Informed, and we've had an overwhelming response with that. So although you may have missed yesterday's form, you don't have to wait until next year. The action teams work uh, throughout the year, have monthly phone calls, work on various projects, and um, if you go to our website, which is npeib.org, you can read not only that piece, but you can read about the national plan. Under the leadership of our colleague Victor V, who was actually here uh, earlier, had to fly for a meeting back to Minnesota, he should be back momentarily. Um, we developed the National Plan of Action, essentially a, group, a blueprint for social change with recommendations towards ending interpersonal violence. And it's not just about racism, right? It's also about sexism. So those of us who are ageism, it's all about the isms, which is what kind of makes it hard, but also makes it easy. Because you have to look at where you're privileged and at what point you're privileged and how you're using your privilege. Privilege actually confers a great deal of responsibility in really looking at what everybody has been saying and how is it that you would do your work differently and how would you use your privilege to actually change things. Change is never easy. You know, it's easy for me to sit and say, oh yeah, change. But I ask myself, how much have I changed? I mean, I teach on this, but my biases are like a few binders full. Uh, but the difference is that I actually re recognize what they are. And then how do you control for that? I actually want to come back to a point you raised that yes, United States fundamentally is a land of immigrants who forcibly took land, who forcibly bought people here. And therefore, the assimilation code has never been easy. And you see these periods 
where people are wanted, where people are not wanted. So there you go, you know, native genocide, slavery, Japanese internment. I mean, you've seen these are over and over again. My question always is, what have we learned from history? And how do you actually avoid it? So your point, yes, we have to raise all our voices to say that this is unacceptable. Because right now, I mean, what Joyce was earlier saying also about Detroit Flint, for immigrant women who are experiencing violence, for immigrant children who are experiencing child sexual violence, it is not easy, right? What do you, what do we actually, tell? all the tools, quote, we have, do not work. They, because they really jeopardize safety. And what is it that our policies are if ICE were to show up on your doorstep? You know, your police showing up in SWAT gear, most of us will open the door and not say, excuse me, shut it. What do we do when they're coming to? And that's the point, I think, at this point, we have to seriously consider, yes, we would like to be somewhere else, and that's our vision, but the reality today is actually quite different. And that's what the struggle really is. Sandy? Nobody wants me to talk. Inter intersectionality implies societal integration. But public policy at the local and national levels is creating community and political segregation. How do we promote public policy at all levels to promote the integration of people, not the segregation? Good question. Have a seat at the that's table. Mm. Um, that's a that starting point. Because um, that whole squeaky wheel process really makes a difference. Um, we talk about collaboration and coordination and all these other terms, but sometimes we leave it to other people to show up at the meeting. And I know one thing that happens frequently as an African American is uh, when I'm going to a meeting is to really see how many other African American people are there. And uh, when I, I can, I've been in the White House, so I was a presidential appointee, and I was the only person uh, in that role as a senior director looking at some, some very strange uh, issues that were going on. And, you really see how policy is made in this country. Um, the people who can get through the door, their voices are heard. If your voice is not heard because you haven't gotten through the door. So it really does mean that everybody has to take a role of being involved. Uh, being involved even in something like uh, in PEIV, where you're gonna be looking at what the conferences should look like and what the um, subjects that are going to be there. and the public policies that we write um, you know, from this organization that I've been involved in, in a long time means that it really does require us to give of ourselves. Uh, and so that's really the best way to handle this. It's almost the only way, is to really have a seat at the table. I I'm a nurse by training, and uh, I recall in my very, very early nursing days, um, I was a student, and I had an opportunity to go to a real live public adult meeting when I was a, a young student. And it was looking at ambulance services. And it was really dividing up where ambulances should go to which hospital. And everyone sitting around the table was an uh, ambulance uh, owner, a medical tech. First of all, there were no females there and there were definitely no nurses. And you can't talk about healthcare without understanding the role of nurses. It really laid a very important message in my mind at that time, that your voice is as important as the next person's. And if you don't have a seat at the table, if you leave it to other people, then the issues that are important to you are less likely to be heard or understood. Um, so I think you have to just stand up and own it and take a seat at the table. Can I add two things to that? Okay. So seat, uh, seat at the table is actually really good. And I will tell you, uh, since everybody's into storytelling and narratives, here we go. You know, uh, seating at the table is an interesting thing because we always say, as advocates, we always push our way into spaces where we are not wanted. And so some of us are really good at doing that. So when you get a seat at the table, it's very flattering that I get a seat at the table to re represent all Asian Americans. 
And I am actually very flattered by it, okay? Like, okay, I know everything there is to know about all the Asian communities in <laughs> Asia, here, diaspora. You know, yes, sure, you know? And we, some of us who have higher levels of degrees think we, we know everything anyway. The responsibility then, you know, for those of us who are at the table, is to bring in other people who are not like mm -hmm. us, who don't think like us, but who from our communities have a totally different perspective and who we disagree with, like you saw here earlier, right here, right? That some of us did disagree. Some people said, some people didn't say. Okay, that is a very critical thing because that's the only way you can illustrate what intersectionality looks like. That all of us are not the same, we don't think the same, we see our communities differently, and those diverse voices from our communities have to be represented at the table. There is a lot of work at this point in time that you have to do locally. The federal government is the federal government, and sometimes you should just forget that they even exist. Because in order to change at that level, it's the local community organizing that mm -hmm. has to take place. And I'm going to use Arizona as an example, in particular Phoenix. For those of you who are from Arizona, you all remember Sheriff Arpaio. Sometimes I can't get his name out of my uh, mouth even. <laughs> but, but you know, the way it changed, it took 15 years of community organizing to get the community together to force that change. Your 15 years seems a long time in my lifetime, but it really isn't, it's just a speck. But it's really local organizing that then gets reflected at the state at the federal level. So you have to do your work locally. I always say, it's not just about service provision, it's about justice and justice for the most vulnerable. You work where your feet are planted, whatever that is. It's, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> so, um, I, I wanted to say two things. One is around, I think the questions that we are getting are from a sense of like trying to figure it out and almost from the point of fear. Right? So the question is, we can operate from, and we can begin operating from fear, or we can begin operating from strength. And I urge you to begin operating from your strength. And here's a challenge for you in that level, okay? Look at your organizations, and this has to be a non-negotiable. If you want to send a message to the federal government and to our president, then start with where you are, okay? Look at your boards of directors. Ensure that half of them are women and half of them are people of color. Okay? Not one black person. Okay? That is supposed to represent women and men depending, right? So just make sure it's 50 percent. It's gender parity and racial parity. Okay? Ensure that if your community that you're serving offer undocumented immigrants, figure out how to get their voices in. Right? And just do that as homework moving out of this particular meeting to ensure gender parity within the next year. And I know you can do it. It's starting to look at our language and our thinking from early ages on where we're using or others are using categories because that's what leads to the isms. And again, there isn't any ism that is good, from sexism to racism to ageism, and we can keep going. But our tendency is to continue to do that. And what's different about this year from many prior years is the isms have gone to the forefront. It's not just hidden. So in one respect, that's good. It's gotten out of the closet, so to speak, which enables us to counter them overtly. And as all the panelists have said, that's the key, stepping forward. So I specifically wore another one of my Save the Children ties because this one says, if we could all just work together, 
Can you see all the different components of the topic? So I'd like to leave us with that thought. And on a more humorous note, since we're going to lunch, remember if you're sitting at the table or if you're on the menu. <laughs> Take care.